Welcome to the reading room. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Scott Kikawa, the author of several murder mystery books, uh, novels featuring Detective Sergeant Yoshikawa in 1950s Hawaii. The novels are called Kona Winds, Red Dirt, and Chashu. Scott Kikawa has appeared in many of anthologies and collections and is the recipient of several awards, including the Elliott Cades Award for Literature. He is a columnist and associate editor of the Hawaii Review of Books. He is a federal law enforcement officer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Anne. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, your stories have situations and events that many can relate to in Hawaii. How would you describe your work and what do you write about? Well, it's basically detective fiction. And it's detective fiction inspired by the works of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, who are my two favorite authors in late high school and college. It was the literature that spoke to me. And I had wanted to do books uh, that were in the same genre, I, I, I guess maybe, or the same subgenre. And uh, the caveat was that they were supposed to be set here uh, with a local protagonist. To my surprise, nobody had done that before. So it, it turned out to be a, a worthwhile project. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I know that Detective Sergeant Yoshikawa is a, you know, a local detective. And how, how, what is your inspiration for, the, the, for this detective? You know, um, a lot of people have asked if he's actually based on a real life person. And the answer to that is no, not really. But I wanted to create a character that was Japanese, local Japanese, who did not fit the stereotype of how those characters are usually portrayed. In most cases, when you have a Japanese American character, they're usually straight laced individuals who are ordered, law abiding, um, and kind of really, to be honest, have a lack of personality. Uh, I wanted somebody who was sarcastic, someone who bent the rules on occasion, because there are guys like that in our community. And uh, I, I did not see that representation in literature a great deal. Yeah, I really appreciate um, the fact that uh, your detective is sarcastic, because <laughs> there's humor throughout the novel, although it's a murder mystery. And yeah, I really enjoy the, the tone that the book takes. There are many memorable scenes in your, your three books, three novels, uh, Kona Wins, Red Dirt, and Chashu. What is your favorite novel, and why is this work your favorite, and would it be possible for you to read some of your work? Sure. Um, I think this is kind of in two parts. Uh, what I'll read probably isn't my favorite scene, but um, my favorite scene that I had written, I think, is in the second book, Red Dirt. This is the book that is set against the backdrop of the House Un-American Activities Committee's communist uh, witch hunts of the 1950s right here um, in this, well, it was a territory back then. And I think it's around chapter 11 where the protagonist detective, Yoshikawa, interviews a, a few members of a local communist cell uh, they did exist um, in their defense. Many of them had joined the Communist Party because it was a necessity, because they could find no other means of having the resources to organize labor movements. Not all of them had joined the Communist Party, but those who did had secretive meetings. Uh, my research says that some of these meetings were mobile meetings to thwart authorities. Um, and this was one such meeting, our detective tails a, a vehicle. Uh, this was one of those mobile communist cell meetings. He chases them down to Houston Street, and they end up having a drink at the Willows, uh, which is a frequent setting of my books because it was a very popular restaurant at the time. It, it unfortunately no longer exists, though the property's still there. And uh, it's one of those exchanges where Many have told me that it was one of their favorite chapters. A uh, little too hard to read because it's a lot of dialogue. I don't do many different voices very well. Uh, but I'll read from the most recent book, Chashu. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I, I look forward to um, hearing your reading. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm going to read a little from the prologue. Uh, the prologue is something that uh, my editor, up, up, up until this book, uh, Juliet Kono, our, our friend, uh, had suggested in the first book, Kono Wins, that the first couple of pages of the first chapter was really a prologue in her mind. So it kind of broke off, became a prologue, and that turned out to be a brilliant idea for a lot of crime fiction. Like, I, I know there are authors like Elmore Leonard who have suggested in their guidebooks on how to write crime fiction that writing a prologue is one of the cardinal sins that you should never, ever write a prologue for a crime fiction novel. But it, it, it went against convention. And it made a lot of sense, and it's become my, fav my favorite part of a lot of the books. And that's thanks to Juliet. She's just brilliant, and she suggested that I do a prologue. We turned into a prologue, so she wanted a prologue for, for Red Dirt as well. And I decided on my own, uh, because about three quarters of the way, unfortunately, Juliet had to stop editing uh, my work. But I decided on my own that I was going to make a prologue for Chashu. And this is because this, is a, um, this was something that Juliet, I think, would have asked for eventually. And I think that if I'm lucky enough to have subsequent books, I'll always put a prologue because of her. So I'll read a little bit from the prologue and a little from the following first paragraphs of the first chapter. So this is the prologue to Chashu, which is the third and current novel and it takes place against the backdrop of the real life, well, a, a situation which is inspired by the real life HPD kickback scandals of the territorial period. It's a little anachronistic because that scandal actually took place in the late 1940s. So I've moved it forward a bit from the Chief Gabrielson administration into the Chief Liu administration about five years into the future, four to five years into the future. But this is with the thought that although the investigation on the real life scandal resolved itself, things usually pick up in another form, you know, especially with, with criminal or illicit activity, nature abhors a vacuum and somebody eventually moves to fill it. And this is kind of what I think it would look like if somebody else were to take up the, uh, uh, the collections racket uh, in, in the police department. So this is a prologue, and I hope it gives you some indication of that. Um, I'm going to read this in what I call detective monotone, which is what I always read this in, because this is the voice that I envision it in. So sorry if it, uh, it, it is not pleasing to the ear, but uh, um, it's really the only voice I know how to. <laughs> so uh, here's a prologue for Chashu. Absolution. Forgiveness is big brother. Pain in the ass to seek, a pain in the ass to find. Sooner or later, everybody needs it because everybody screws up. If you think this doesn't apply to you, you either live in deep denial or you need to get thee to a nunnery pronto. The problem with most people seeking absolution is that they bark up all the wrong trees. God, ex-wives, the brand new shiny internal revenue service, any and everyone they victimize by their selfishness, avarice, or poor judgment. Others can forgive, but in the end, can absolve. Absolution comes from within. It's a hell of a thing to absolve yourself when your soul is weighed down by a badge and a 38. There are no black hats and white hats in the real world. There are only gray hats with brim stained yellow by nicotine and cold sweat. My world is an Elysian throw rug of pretty colors covering a minefield of false hopes and ulterior motives. Honolulu, territory of Hawaii. Cops don't bring home the bacon here, we bring home the chashu. Sticky, sweet, fragrant pork to make the bland starch of existence palatable enough to swallow. The most addictive vice of them all, free money. At first, you convince yourself that extorting the extorters is not only acceptable, it's righteous. That taking crook's money keeps them in line, and that you deserve what you take as a reward for pruning the racketeering head so that it doesn't grow out of control. It's fine, isn't it? After all, it's nobody's money. Nobody's when you shook it out of some dissolute gambler's pocket. But it used to be somebody's. A bride's dowry from the old country, some mom and pop's life savings. It used to be a dream house or some kid's college tuition. But human weakness brought it into some den of iniquity and placed it in your hot little hand. 
Trust you can pay a lot of bills, but it moves absolution further out of your reach. The more you take, the more distant it gets, until you have to put your life on the line to close the gap. For you, most wicked sir, whom to call brother would even infect my mouth, I do forgive thy rankest fault. My rankest fault I will absolve at the business end of a cult automatic. So that was the prologue, and it rolls right into chapter one, and I'll read the first couple of chap uh, paragraphs of chapter one. Hell is empty and all the devils are here. Shakespeare, The Tempest, Act One, Scene Two. All the devils are here, I thought, right here in Chinatown on Mount Achaea Street. And most of them weren't even at the pie gao tables. They were sprawled on the red sofas, stuffing complimentary gao ji in their flush faces, shiny and desperate with cheap beer. A short respite from the big money games and the whores and the opium pipes beyond the beaded curtain. The bard of Avon knew even devils needed a break from hell. Honolulu's Chinatown, January 1954, Hell's Waiting Room. I was standing right in it, leaning on a Formica counter, looking at the second hand on my wristwatch, running another lap around the face. I didn't bother removing my pork pie hat. I never did on these pickups. Gentlemen doffed their chapeaus when coming to call, and this was no place for gentlemen. The upstairs lounge of Jade Garden Chop Suey was littered with devils in shirt sleeves and aloha shirts and pomaded black hair. They puffed away on their cigarettes and filled the room with a dull yellow-gray miasma that clung to the walls mixed in with the peanut oil dust and the shit of roaches that migrated from the kitchen downstairs. Some were nursing the wounds to their wallets from the gaming tables and the silk-clad hookers. Some were slowly finding their way out of their sticky, sweet opium dreams. Some were just basking in the sanctuary, hiding out just a moment longer from nagging houses, nagging wives, nagging brats in a nagging world. None of them paid attention to me. Of, the, of all the devils there, maybe I was the worst of them. Detective Sergeant Francis Hideyuki Yoshikawa, Honolulu Police Department. Homicide detail. That's what the cards in my pocket said. Nobody actually called me Francis except my 10th grade math teacher at McKinley High School. My parents couldn't even pronounce the name they gave me, so they called me Hidekun, a, dimin a diminutive of Hideyuki, like a Japanese Bobby or Billy. To my sisters, my friends, and my wife, I was Frankie. To my fellow cops and bagman, I was the sheik. Maybe my cards should have said part-time bagman, too. It was a new function I took up. I loved the task about as much as a root canal. In a place like the one I was in, I was probably called something much worse, but never to my face. So it's like a little bit of the oh, first chapter. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the voice of the detective sergeant. And you can vividly see you know, the settings in your, in your novels. Uh, it takes place, like you mentioned, in 1950s Hawaii. Uh, what do you have? It, what advice do you have regarding writing stories that take place in different time periods? Well, if anyone wants to write a period that they're not familiar with, like I wasn't familiar with because I didn't live through the period, the the one word uh, I'm going to give to them is research. Research is one of those tasks that a lot of writers fear and hate. Uh, I don't, uh, I can't understand why. Maybe it's because I was a history major in college, but I love research and it takes you down a lot of different rabbit holes. Uh, Territorial Hawaii is one of those places that I saw the last vestiges of as a, a young child. It was already a state by then, by the time I was born, uh, we were a state here, but you saw institutions, buildings, and certainly people that had lived through the period that were still around. I think that things started changing forever by the time I got into college. I went away to college on the mainland. When I came back, uh, it was a different place altogether. In just a period of four, four to five years, uh, we had changed drastically. A lot of mom and pop stores had shut down that were institutions. They were, they were, they were increasingly replaced by mainland chains. And what you see today uh, is kind of a society that resembles any other across America. Some would say that's progress and some would say that's a good thing, but it does come with a downside. Uh, I think that we're losing a lot of the character we had uh, of a place that I grew up with or maybe saw the last pieces of. But in order to reconstruct that, I've had to go back and do a lot of research. So it was, it was archival research. 
It was research in the libraries. It was research online. Uh, it was utilizing the state archives. Uh, I'm fortunate that a lot of places have opened up their collections to me. Uh, the University of Hawaii West Oahu has something called the CLEAR, the Center for Labor Education and Research. Uh, Dr. Bill Pewitt there has graciously opened up the CLEAR's collection, their archive to me, to examine primary sources, handwritten notes by John Reinecke, one of the Hawaii Seven. Uh, his legal pad was in that collection. I got to peruse those notes. The, uh, the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center on Maui has also opened up their collection of photographs and oral history transcripts of veterans, and I'm, I'm able to peruse those whenever I go to Maui. The Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, uh, their uh, Tokyoka Heritage Resource Center, has, I'm, I'm, I'm practically a resident there uh, most of my days off if I can arrange to. I spend a lot of the day there going through their archival material and their primary sources. They've got wonderful things there like, uh, like the original Cherry Blossom Festival programs going all the way back to the very first one in 1953 and they have them yearly and I peruse those. The most fascinating things of course are the advertisements, right? Institutions that you may recognize that are no longer around. But for anybody who wants to do this kind of writing, I think research is key. Uh, it's also anecdotal research. I interview a lot of people, including my, mo my own mother who lived through the period as a, a young person and her contemporaries. I, I write in a period where we have a handful of people left that live through the period, but they are quickly disappearing. And it, it's imperative that I get to talk to as many of those people as I can if I'm going to continue writing in this period. Um, for others, it may be different. They may set it further in the past, in which case most of their research is going to be documentary research. But I think it's no less methodical and it's no less um, labor intensive. You have to put the work into it. But I happen to enjoy it. I hope that anybody who writes anything like that enjoys it too. Yeah, wow, thank you. And there, there's an appreciation of history that, that I can, you know, that I hear from you, and that results in a, a lot of details in, in your novels. So I really appreciate that. Are there any um, scenes that you write that may be influenced by personal experiences, or are there any topics that you would not write about? Well, you know, a lot of people have asked me because of my real life occupation. I work for the federal government as a law enforcement officer, and they ask if any of my crime fiction work is based on my real life occupation work, and the answer is no. Uh, that's because I think that law enforcement today is a much different animal from what it used to be, especially in the 1950s. In the 1950s, this was before a lot of the key landmark U.S. Supreme Court decisions that governed a lot of what restricts law enforcement today. Um, it was a good thing because it professionalized law enforcement, but decisions like Miranda versus Arizona, the, the you have the right to remain silent, that didn't happen until 1963 or 64, I think. Um, Gideon versus Wainwright, um, if you can't afford an attorney, uh, the state will appoint one for you. So there are Supreme Court decisions that were not around at the time my character had enforced the law. So uh, there was a lot more leeway, uh, that maybe that's a euphemistic word to use, uh, where cops used to routinely do things like beat confessions out of their suspects. But in their mind, they were doing the right thing. In their mind, these people were guilty. They knew it. Uh, in a large sense, we know that a lot of our suspects today are. Uh, our job is not to figure out who, who done it, which is what the premise of most mysteries are. It's a, because we know who they are, our job is to figure out, uh, or, or our job is to prove that they did it. And I know that nobody wants to read a book about that. So. Are, is anything I write inspired by any of my actual experience? I would say that mostly uh, that would be in terms of family dialogue uh, because, and, and not the subject matter or the exact words, but, uh, but the, uh, the tone of it, uh, especially between a child and parent, between siblings, between a husband and wife. Uh, these, these are things that 
I know about, that, that most people know about, and there are microaggressions and there are subtext to every family discussion, and they certainly exist in my book. So I would say that uh, of all the real life inspiration I could draw from, th those are the ones that find their way into my text. Is there anything I won't write about? Uh, Subject-wise, I think nothing is taboo. Uh, I, I, I am flattered by many who have put my work in the noir genre, which means that anything really goes, and you, usually the more uh, the dirtier, the more sordid, the better. Uh, so it, there are no taboo topics. But what I won't write is I won't write about this place or about its people from the same viewpoint uh, that outside writers have written about this place. I will not exploit uh, the beauty of the nature here uh, or the quaintness of the, the culture here in order to add flavor to my writing. Uh, this is what my friend Don Wallace at Honolulu Magazine refers to as tourist lit. And uh, tourist lit was the reason I got into doing this in the first place, because everything that was written here in the crime fiction genre that I could see, with very, very few exceptions, had been tourist lit. And I was sick of reading it. Um, and I know a lot of people here are probably sick of reading it. So um, there's something different, but that's something that I won't do. Yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that, because I think a lot of people appreciate that you're a writer from Hawaii, you know, and then you have all of this experience being here and you have a realistic portrayal uh, regarding the characters and your research that that adds another level or uh, realism that a lot of the other um, types of uh, fiction or other uh, works in other genres by other writers that kind of think of Hawaii as the destination and it, it might not be as accurate you know as, as your, your novels uh, reflect so great great now we talk a lot about writing especially when we go to different schools uh, describe your writing process well it's funny you should bring that up, and I know that we had this discussion before. You're in the Bamboo Ridge study group with me. I'm, I'm really honored to be in that group. I, I think that's all of uh, Hawaii's best writers, including you, uh, and I'm like the only one that's not famous in that group. Um, but a lot of folks in our study group have called me prolific, and I know that they, meant, they mean that as a compliment, but a, a lot of times, uh, outside, because everyone in the Bamboo Ridge study group is nice, uh, but outside uh, an environment like that, usually prolific is an insult. It's a, it's a dig that literary writers take at genre writers like me and say, uh, you're so prolific. Another one is accessible. Your work is accessible, you know? Um, that, that means the, the, common, the lowest common denominator can appreciate it, and that's why it sells a lot. Uh, and, and by the way, my work doesn't sell nearly as much as, as a lot of um, accessible writers do. Uh, but um, I always say uh, the pro my process is easier, I think, than yours is a as a poet or, uh, or our friends that write literary fiction or short fiction. Because what you guys are creating, I think, is art. Uh, you're trying to create something beautiful. You're trying to create something uh, that comes from a deeper inspiration. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, that's a hard process. For me, my process is easy by comparison, and it's simple. All I do is figure out when and where I want this thing. I drop a dead body in it, and I figure out how it got there. And that's my process. Uh, it's, it's oversimplifying it a bit, but that's, that's how it works uh, for the most part. So I figure out, yes, I want the labor strike of 1949 to be the backdrop. Uh, I put a corpse in it, and I figure out how it got there. And it, it, it repeats itself, but hopefully the result ends up being something that is different each time because the, the process is different. Uh, I'm not like a lot of mystery writers that outline their work. They outline the plot from beginning to end. They already know who done it at the end. Uh, they know how the investigator gets there to come to that conclusion. Uh, I don't do that. I can't. Um, I, w with the first book, I didn't outline at all uh, because it was my first book. I, I'd never written anything before like this, and quite frankly, I didn't know what I was doing. So I kind of blundered around and was trial and error. By the time I got to the second book, The Red Dirt, I tried to outline it, 
I did have an outline, but you know what? Uh, same with Chashu. I had an outline, and I ended up scrapping it about 75% of the way in and said, you know what, this is not how it's going to end. It's going to end a different way because a revelation comes to me later, uh, which is kind of like with the first book. So for me, it's more of a discovery process than it is um, um, a methodical or an outline process, uh, which kind of goes against the grain, I, I understand, with a lot of mystery writers. Um, but that's, that's fairly my process. Um, I'm not one of those guys that writes uh, early in the morning or late at night. I know there's a lot of advice out there for writers, the, from established writers who say, uh, put your butt in the chair and discipline yourself to put in a thousand words a day, two thousand words a day, uh, five thousand words a day. Uh, I can't do that. I'm, I'm exhausted at the end of the day. The last thing I want to do is sit down and write something. That's a fantasy. I, I do all this stuff on my days off. Uh, I do it on my vacations. And I work furiously when I have free time, a large block of free time. But that's my process. Uh, sorry if I shattered any romantic illusions of how this thing works, but uh, um, you do what you can. And, uh, and for me, I fit this into the vacant corners of my life, of, of which are very, very few. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing that because I know every writer has a different process, you know, and it's so good to find your process, you know, and I know a lot of when, when reading your novels, you know, especially where there's all of those his, historic details, you know, and it's so, I think a lot of readers get so swept up in how realistic it is. Your world that you create is so real because of all of the accuracy, you know, that it's just such a joy to read, so. Well, well thank you, you know, and I, I can't take all the credit for it. You know, uh, at Bamboo Ridge, we have uh, a great, probably the best editing team anywhere, right? From our content editors, uh, Juliet and Jean Toyama uh, have been my content editors. Milton Kimura has stepped in on Red Dirt and been a content editor. But uh, we also have this great copy editing team, Gil Harada. And Normie Salvador is the king of fact checkers. He keeps me honest and from writing myself into historic error. He had checked out for Chashu uh, when television shows used to air in the early 1950s. So he told me I could not place, um, I could not place Dragnet uh, or the Ed Sullivan Show on a certain night because it only aired on Sundays. So I had to, I had to change the show. Um, but, it, but it really pays off because uh, people will say, you know, that uh, it rings of accuracy, especially people who live through the period. So thank you. Uh, Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Normie. Uh, thank you, all, all of all, all of you people who have have kept me honest and and kept me from uh, straying into uh, incorrect uh, fact. Yeah. Now, it, uh, our next question is: No matter how talented a writer is, uh, there's always a chance for writer's block. Well, what is your cure for writer's block? Well, I think writer's block for me happens much less frequently because writer's block, I think, is something that occurs when you have a writer that writes consistently and frequently. I'm not one of those guys that writes frequently or consistently. I write when I have what, what I perceive to be the time, and that is getting to me uh, to be shorter and rarer than, uh, than before, than ever before. But... When I get stuck, uh, when I do have instances of writer's block, um, I have a couple of ways of dealing with it. The first way is to pick up Raymond Chandler again and read some of my favorite chapters from some of his favorite, uh, or my favorite novels of his, um, like The Little Sister or like uh, um, The Long Goodbye. And not to imitate him, uh, but to draw some inspiration, because Chandler was so good at really fighting his way out of situations where he may have been stuck uh, with plot points, uh, with ideas. And he does it by expressing thoughts lyrically that are, are kind of like they're tangential to the plot, but they really add more um, depth to the uh, protagonist. Uh, you, you get a sense of the detective's personality in a lot of these vignettes that he writes. But, um, but I also kind of get this intuitive sense that he got stuck somewhere, and this is why 
he has this monologue uh, about the traffic in Los Angeles or about uh, how department stores uh, are kind of the hallmark of the decline of society. It has nothing to do with the murder, but it does give you some insight. And by the time he's done with that diatribe or that monologue, the plot picks up again. Uh, and I like to read through that kind of stuff and, uh, and figure out uh, how to pick up uh, the trail again after I have a diversion. And it inspires me to do that. Uh, it doesn't always work, though. Uh, when that doesn't work, uh, I have to turn to what I call the nuclear option, which is I take my manuscript and I read it from the very first page all the way to the point where I get stuck. And what this does is this kind of jars my memory or jogs my memory and it says, okay, yes, I remember now this character. I remember this incident. And it pulls things forward and, uh, and gives me kind of pieces to work with to continue the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the manuscript. Um, I call that the nuclear option because that is so time consuming uh, to read, especially if you're in, in, on chapter 21 or something. Th that is going all the way back to chapter one, to the prologue, and then reading forward all the way to where you are. And, uh, but I find that that works 100% of the time. It, it gets you unstuck, you know. I don't recommend it for everybody, though. Wow, thank you. And um, as, as you know, you're an award-winning author, and many people appreciate your work and discuss your work in classrooms. Think of a time before all the publications, all your novels. What advice do you have for anyone who wants to be a writer? For anyone who wants to be a writer, and especially a writer here, here in Hawaii, uh, write the story that nobody else has written yet is the first piece of advice. And there are a lot of them that are out there. You know, I, I wrote a book about a, a Japanese-American uh, Nisei detective. Nobody else had written a book like that yet. Uh, to my shock, I, I thought that it, was, it had probably already been done, but nobody had done that yet. Uh, but you know what? It, if there was a book about a, uh, a local Filipino detective, local Micronesian detective, or Samoan detective, I would buy that book in a heartbeat because nobody's written it yet. Somebody's got to pick that book up, or, or somebody's got to uh, take up the task of writing it because nobody's written it yet. The other thing I would suggest is, uh, besides, and this goes hand in hand with write the write the book that nobody's written yet, is write the book that only you can write. There's a lot, you know, it's a truism that no two people are alike, uh, but it's not necessarily a truism that no two stories are alike because I've seen duplicates especially when there's a trend that people seize on, and it's usually a sales trend, where they think that uh, the flavor of the month now uh, is like teenager, you know, teenage vampires in love or boy wizards or whatever it is, and everybody comes up with a book uh, to ride on the coattails of, of that success. I think that uh, you're better off writing the book that nobody else can write uh, based on your unique set of experiences based on your unique desires uh, or uh, interests. You put those two things together, and I think uh, that's a book that I would buy. I think that's a book that a lot of people would buy and read. And uh, especially here, you know, I, I go back to Don Wallace again, uh, and he has said that Hawaii is the only state in the country with its own literature. You know, and, uh, and Eric Chalk and Daryl Lum, the, the founding editors of Bamboo Ridge, uh, have said that we have something unique here, you know? Um, I know in the, the original Talk Story conference, the seminal one of 1978, there were some clashes with mainland Asian American writers, uh, and that's because their stuff was all about protest. Their stuff was all about injustice. Our stuff was about uh, our experiences here and what life was like, you know? and. Uh, um, not to uh, dismiss their work on the mainland, but I think that our work uh, speaks from a more authentic place. Yeah. And uh, I think that more people should do that. More writers should do that. More people should read it, for crying out loud. They, more people should read, period. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad that you mentioned it, because there's a lot of uh, uh, Native Hawaiian authors, uh, Pacific yes. Island authors, um, uh, Asian American authors, um, so many. Uh, you know, Hawaii, as you as you know, is so uh, unique in many ways, and I, I really appreciate what you said about um, having uh, their experiences and uh, uh, being brought out there and 
I, I hope um, it'll be more, uh, our, our stories are read like throughout, you know, the, the globe basically, you know. Well, I, I hope so have, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your work and for spending time with all of us in the reading room. And um, also, I, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, for staying with us for another episode of The Reading Room. And we'd like to thank Scott Kikawa for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> it's my pleasure.